Welcome, Mr. Brooks. Good morning. What's changed since Ferguson? Uh, in the years since Michael Brown tragically lost his life, there's been a seismic shift in American attitude, but only a, only a glacial shift in legislative action. So we have seen 60% uh, of Americans uh, assert that they believe that it's important for there to be fundamental change with respect to equal rights in this country. But in terms of legislative action, uh, 40 legislatures have taken up some measure of holding police departments accountable, but only a tiny fraction of which have actually moved toward holding police departments accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, Congress. Uh, Congress has taken some action to count the number of tragic police-involved uh, deaths in terms of Tamir Rice's, Michael Brown's, Sandy Bland's, but beyond counting the number of deaths to actually preventing those deaths, they've not taken any action. When you, when you talk about holding police accountable, we're talking about body cameras, what else? Uh, body cameras, independent prosecutors, training, retraining our police departments to ensure that they use the most effective techniques. The point being here is we know that where communities are the subject of police protection as opposed to objects of suspicion, police officers are safer, as are communities. But we've not seen action, which is why uh, the NAACP and so many others have engaged in this march from Selma, Alabama to Washington, D.C., that we call America's Journey for Justice, in which we plan on bringing thousands of people into the nation's capital on September 15th to call on Congress to do a couple of specific things. Pass the In Racial Profiling Act. Two, pass the Law Enforcement Trust and Integrity Act. In other words, we have to call on police departments to not engage in racial profiling, which they're free to do now. Uh, two, we have to call on them to retrain their officers. And three, use evidence-based strategies for policing. Uh, these things that we're calling on Congress to do are, in fact, time-tested and work. But we've got to have action. What's your sense? You've given us a sense of the change in the police side of this equation. What has changed in the last year in terms of communities? Mm -hmm. What evolution has taken place there? Well, what we've seen is a generation of young practitioners of democracy, young people who are taking uh, the power of this democracy in their hands and taking to the streets. We're seeing older people do the same. So we're seeing this multi-generational uh, army of activists. Think about it this way. Tamir Rice was 12 years old. Michael Brown was 18, Walter Scott was 40, uh, Eric Garner uh, was older. And so the point being here is that we have multi-generational victims, we need multi-generational advocates. And along those lines, advocates, we've, we've been talking about Black Lives Matter That's and right. uh, the, protests, the protests at speeches. Are you, what's your feeling about that tactic? Well, the, the point here is not how polite our activists are, but how responsive our politicians are. Uh, when you have an 18-year-old who's frustrated, who's, who wants to see politicians step up yeah. and bring this tragedy to an end, now you can call on them to be more polite or you can actually get something done. We are calling on Congress to get something done. And the debate seems to be whether it is a racial issue or uh, an economic issue. Bernie Sanders says it's both. What's the answer? It is, in fact, both. But here's the reality. When African-American men are 21 times more likely to lose their lives at the hands of the police than their white counterparts, uh, there's an element of race here. But as we saw in Baltimore, when neighborhoods go up in flames, when young people lose their lives and they are surrounded by poverty and by economic desperation, it's a class issue as well as a race issue. But more importantly, fundamentally, it is an American issue because we don't have to have this conversation a year from now if we take action now. And I'd, I'd like to note this. In the, year, the week in which we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, sure. we have a badly broken Voting Rights Act. And so what we're doing uh, at the NAACP on behalf of the nation is issuing a justice challenge. We're saying to anybody running for president, if you want the people's vote, protect the right to vote and call on Congress to protect the right to vote by fixing the vote, Voting Rights Act. That is our justice challenge, and right. we're issuing it on behalf of the country. I have to end it there. Cornelia William Brooks, thanks so much for being thank with you. us.